so pleased to present my close friend and musical collaborator Mark Stone and his students from Oakland University. Uh, Mark is professor of percussion and world music at Oakland University in Michigan. Mark, I think, is one of the foremost experts of world percussion performance. He has traveled extensively, uh, lived in Ghana for a year, Uganda for a year, has also traveled and studied uh, extensively in Trinidad and South Africa and India, most recently. Um, I consider Mark one of my teachers of world percussion and had the great fortune to be one of the first Americans to play this wonderful instrument you see before you, the Mbaiiri from Uganda, which Mark will present. I also want to give a shout out to Allison Shaw, who was also in that first American Mbaiiri group. So, um, uh, Mark's going to give a presentation. They're going to play. If you want to see the screen, you're welcome to come sit closer. <laughs> Some of this looks pretty small. But please join me in welcoming Mark Stone and Oakland University. Yeah.
of small, so I'd encourage you guys uh, to move up from the back if you want to be able to read everything I have. Um, the majority of this presentation is me sharing some of my research uh, in Uganda, where this instrument, the Imbairi, comes from. And so, for those of you not familiar with the geography of Africa, uh, Uganda is an East African country uh, located right above uh, Lake Victoria, which is the largest uh, Great Lake uh, in Africa. So, right above Lake Victoria. And this instrument you just heard is called the Mbayere. And it comes from the southern part of Uganda. It's played by a group of people there known as the Basoga, and they live in the district called Busoga. Some of you in the room might be familiar with the neighboring district of Buganda um, and their traditions of the Amadinda and Akadinda, of, of which this is very closely related. And so the Busoga uh, live in the far southern part of Uganda, very important place geographically, right where the Nile River leaves Lake Victoria. So pretty easy to find on a map. And the city of Jinja is where I did uh, my research as a Rotary Ambassadorial Scholar for one year uh, studying this uh, tradition. So everything that I'm going to share with you today comes from a group called the Nachibembe Xylophone Group from Nachibembe Village near Jinja. And like so many uh, African percussion traditions, this is an oral tradition. So it's just very important for me to let you know where this information is coming from. These guys were my teachers. They actually were more than that. They were like my family during that year that I lived in Uganda. And all the arrangements that I teach my students here from Oakland University that we're sharing with you come from them, as well as the rest of the information I'm sharing. So the Nachibembe Xylophone Group has 15 members in it. And you might notice there's only six parts on the Mbairi xylophone. They actually had two groups of members. So they had like a, a first string and a second string, almost like a basketball team. And so the, the guys who were the understudies were always right there listening. And in fact, this is the traditional way of learning the music. It was rather unusual that I actually set up lessons with them on the weekend. But the, the, the sort of understudy players would be there. Then anytime someone would get up, uh, gigs, of course, last for hours and hours on end, so if someone gets up to get something to eat or whatever, then the other players would jump in. And then the remaining three players were actually uh, singers and dancers, as um, this music also goes with song and dance. Um, all the players tended to specialize in one of the given parts. There was one guy, though, when I was studying, I always made sure he was there, the leader of the group, his name was uh, Weiswa. And all of them were also subsistence farmers. That is to say that they farmed during the day, growing what they needed to survive. And this was something they did just because they loved the music and also they could get a little bit of extra money playing on weekends and so on. With the exception of one guy who had a little uh, bicycle business on the side. So formed primarily to perform at social events and to earn some extra money. Uh, performance context that I worked with the Nachi Bembe group in included weddings, uh, graduation ceremonies, house opening ceremonies, funerals. I got to play with them pretty regularly, uh, and so to go out to these events and play the music they were teaching me. Um, typically, a gig would pay $50, and that's for the whole group. So this was something that was a labor of love for them, but it gave them a little bit of extra money to get things that they couldn't grow on their farms. So this type of group, the Nachi Bembe group, is described throughout Africa, and you also find these in the Caribbean and other places by ethnomusicologists, as a mutual aid society. That is to say that the Nachi Bembe group was far more than a performance group. This was a group of men that would come together to support one another. So uh, one of the members uh, lost a daughter while I was there, a Tenwa, and all the guys were there, slept at his home to support him <coughs> during this time, a very difficult time in his life. Also, as is typical of uh, mutual aid societies, because the Mbairi is played at social events, important events like weddings and funerals, it means that they would play at the funerals, weddings of other members of the group. And so I'm sure all of us have played in music ensembles at some point in our lives where it definitely became more than just the music that the people in the group were our best friends. And this is exactly how the Nachi Bembe group was. And by extension, during my year in Uganda, they truly became uh, my family there. Um, actually, one very important member um, uh, from the university, a friend of mine named Haruna Walusimbi, is the one who, while I was studying at Makerere University as a Rotary Scholar, invited me to come out 
to the village to experience their music. And Haruna was my translator throughout the, the stay. Actually, a Bela Fleck uh, a few years ago came out with a documentary called Throw Down Your Heart. The first half hour of that documentary is my friend Haruna describing the same tradition. So something you guys could look up afterwards. OK, so getting into the construction of the instrument itself. Um, this instrument is a loose key xylophone. So the frame that you see built on the stage today is not the way it's traditionally played. All that we would take to gigs were the bars of wood and the sticks that we play the instrument with. We put them in rice sacks, put them on the back of the bike, and go to the performance. So the wood itself is made out of a very highly resonant type of wood called uh, lusambia. And um, it's made from the very center of the tree, or the heart of the tree. And one thing you'll notice, marimba players, is that the bass key, well, in addition to that, it might be one of the largest <laughs> keys you've ever seen. Um, one thing you'll notice is it's scooped out from both sides. Of course, we typically just scoop from underneath. But the reason it's scooped out of both sides, as you notice in the opening piece we played, uh, Patrick here was playing that key with his hand. So it's very thin in the middle and has a, this huge bass sound. Um, and then the wood of the sticks is called Enzo. Enzo is the wood for the sticks. It's a very hard wood. You might even notice that um, the, the keys are kind of wearing away at the end. After s some years of playing, you eventually have to replace the keys because the wood of the Enzo is actually harder than the Lusambia. And so whenever we would go to a performance, we would actually have to build the frame of the instrument. Um, so you see this box here. That's actually the size of the hole that would be dug in the ground. So you show up at your gig. The very first thing you do is find out, OK, where are we going to play? get out the shovels and start digging. And interviewing the members of Nachi Bimbe, they all said that this was the part of being in the xylophone group that was a bit of a drag. Sometimes the ground could be a bit rocky or, or so on. They might have to start over again. It could take a while. Sometimes we would arrive at a gig at like midnight, and then we'd be you know, digging this hole in the ground. But you can see the size of the box here. So obviously, PASIC wouldn't allow us to dig a hole on the stage. Um, but we have a box um, that's about the same dimensions as the hole in the ground. And then uh, plantain, or what we sometimes call cooking bananas, is a staple throughout all of southern Uganda. And so they just go out to the closest plantain farm, cut down a couple of plantain stalks, and lay it on both sides of that hole in the ground. Okay? And that forms the frame of the instrument. And then finally, to create a cushion for the bars to sit on top of, they'd bundle up some grass and lay that over the plantain, and then of course take some sticks to drive between the keys. So every time that the instrument is played at a performance, you build the frame, but of course you bring the bars with you. OK, so the making of the instrument itself involves a fair amount of ritual. As I said, this is an instrument played at religious events, like weddings and funerals. And so it must be consecrated in order to be played at that type of event. Um, and so when the instrument, the bars itself, are tuned, a chicken is sacrifice, and going to the root of the, the word sacrifice, to make sacred. Um, so a chicken is sacrificed for the tuning of the instrument, but then before the instrument is played, um, a goat is sacrificed. And during these ceremonies, there's a real emphasis on remembering the spirits of the people who came before them, the people who passed down this tradition to them, a very big emphasis of the, the ceremonies. Um, they remember their ancestors, remember uh, late members of the group. And then, quite significantly, the blood of the goat is splashed on the 15th key. You can still see it there a little bit from the ceremony um, that I had for the instrument. And this is common in a lot of African traditions, that instruments take on the human characteristics, the idea that a xylophone actually has a heart. And that 15th key is considered to be the heart of the xylophone that all the other keys relate to. In fact, during the ceremony, the octaves of the 15th key, it's a five note scale, so keys 10, 20, and five also have this, this goat blood uh, splashed on it. Um, so for the Nachi Bembe players, this ceremony is very significant and that they're remembering the people who passed on the tradition to them. Um, but for me, the ceremony had a lot of weight because during it, they passed this instrument on to me and then they said to me, Everything we've taught you during the last year, you must remember, you must go back to the United States, be an ambassador of our music, start your own group. As Roger said some years ago, uh, Roger and Allison were in the first group I started uh, in Michigan, along with some other uh, great players like uh, Gerald Cleaver 
and some others. Um, but this was part of the ceremony, and, and it really struck me, wow, this is, this is heavy. I just can't go back to the U.S. and kind of forget everything they, they taught me. And then I started teaching it, the tradition um, at Oakland University. And so it's certainly the most significant experience that I had in Africa, the ceremony in which the instrument was handed over to me. And also, you know, sometimes we, we might take for granted how easily certain instruments are available. You know, you don't just walk into your music store and get an embiary. This is something I had to commission and wait uh, six months before it was fully made and ready to be played. And then I had to go get this goat and go through the whole <laughs> ceremony. Uh, luckily, my good friend Andy Cook, he's a Scottish guy, the son of the ethnomusicologist Peter Cook, he and I were there doing research together. And, and he had his ceremony just a couple weeks before mine. So, we didn't really know what was about to take place during his, but at least when mine came along, I kind of knew uh, what to expect. So that's a little bit about the ritual that goes with the embayiri. Okay, getting to the history of the instrument. So originally, they just played the top 15 keys. The original tradition was just a 15 key tradition. And this is very similar to, some of you might be familiar with the Amadenda or the Akadenda from neighboring uh, Buganda. And because the Akadenda was played in the very first court of, of Kabaka Chintu, who was the first of a line of 36 kings, we know that that instrument used, we know for sure that that instrument goes back 700 years. It's very clearly documented. The Embairi itself was not connected with a court tradition, however. So we can only speculate that it probably is just as old as the Akadenda. These are neighboring groups. In fact, Luganda and Lusoga, the languages, are about 80% interchangeable. I, I studied Luganda at the university and then would speak that and the Lusoga village and, and most of it worked. So it's likely that the Mbairi is as old. But in interviewing the members of the Nachi Bembe group, they were able to trace it back through four generations of their family. So for sure this tradition is at least 100 years old. And the tradition that they were playing 100 years ago was just the top 15 keys. And so there you see uh, the top three players of the instrument of the Nachi Bembe group. And this structure of the music that you heard, I refer to as a tone bank structure. So I like to describe the different parts that we have. So, omu san sazi. Why don't you try that word with me? Omu san sazi. Literally translates as the one who starts. This is really the most important part as it leads us through all of the different changes. Uh, and Renee is playing this part for us today. So let's hear how that goes. All right, so that's the Omu San Sazi. So you hear this steady group of notes that's played on the beat. And then the second part is called Omu Tabuzi. Try that term. Omu Tabuzi. Omu Tabuzi literally translates as the one who mixes. Okay, so the player, the mixer player, plays notes exactly between the notes of the starter. And this is, of course, the same as the way Amadinda music works. And Stephanie Perlacki here from Oakland University is playing the mixer. We won't have her play the part by itself because it doesn't even make sense to hear it by itself. So let's hear the starter with the mixer to combine. any sense until you have a beat to place it against. Oh, the slide here, this is a term uh, Peter Cook uses to describe this combination of the, the, uh, the parts, describes it as a tone bank, this constant uh, stream of notes you hear by the interlocking of the two parts. And so the steady beat in this music, extremely important to understand where the pulse is, um, is played on the, the blade of a hoe called akade. My colleague from Oakland University, Patrick, is playing that part. And then we also have uh, a shaker, a metal shaker called insas insasi. And this keeps the steady pulse. So akade and insasi. All right, so moving up to the top part of the instrument, omu wobato, try that term. Omu wobato means the player of the small keys. And this is the most improvised part of the music because what this player does, it plays melodies that are based on that constant stream of notes and the tone bank. So if uh, Brandon could just play one of those melodies by itself for us. OK, 
okay. And so that would be really strange to hear it all by itself because it's based on what's happening between the starter and mixer. So I'm going to have Brendan play that part while the guys are playing the tone bank. And then I'm going to have him stop and then have the rest of them go in. I want you guys to, to see if you can still hear his part continuing. All right? So this is the top three parts with the steady beat. West African xylophone music before studying this tradition. And when I first started listening to it, all I heard was this constant stream of notes, just, just constantly going on. And I learned that I had to kind of step back from the sound to be able to really understand it. And so in this way, I think the way this music sounds is very similar to the visual art form of pointillism. So this is how I was first hearing the music when I was in Uganda, and just like hearing tick -tick 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 all these tone banks going on. And then over time, I learned to kind of step back, and then a picture would emerge, just like the way pointillism. So I was kind of like a guy with my face right up against the pointillistic picture, just seeing all those individual notes. And so as we play, um, I encourage you to try to listen to the, the bigger picture and, and hear the, tone, the resultants that emerge from the tone bank structure of the music. Does that make sense to everyone? Mm -hmm. OK, so this is the top three parts. So it wasn't until the, the 1950s that the guys, uh, they started to add more parts to the music. So before they expanded the instrument, um, they simply began playing drums with the, with, the, with the imbairi. So we have three different drum parts here. We have the enene, which is the large drum. We have endumi, which is the lead drum. And engabe, which is the long drum. And so together, they play a rhythm called Tamanaibuga, which means don't break my gourd. And this is a very popular <laughs> dance rhythm in Uganda. Tamanaibuga. It sounds like this. earlier, and at first they just copied the idea from the neighboring Bunyole people, but then they decided to play their own music on it. So they started to play these drum parts on the wood itself. So this is the same Tamani Vuga drum rhythm, but now played on the bars of the xylophone. Let's hear it, guys. added this 21st key, this that large key, just to be able to play the Ngabe or Ngulabi drum on the bottom. And so the different parts that we have here 
are the omunene. Another word for you to try, omunene. Omunene. Omunene means the player of the big keys. So now that they move this drum part onto the xylophone, it can do more than just play the tamane buga rhythm. It can actually start to play bass lines, things that sound like this. instrument is called Omudumi, Omudumi, which translates as the commander. This is actually an offbeat part that kind of sits on top of everything, and it's, it's the one part that I could stop at any moment and the music kind of wouldn't fall apart, and, and this, the person who plays this needs to know all the other parts, just like a master drummer in West African music would correct anything that they need to correct. But the um, Indumi part, or Omudumi, in addition to playing these offbeats, also plays a kind of mixer part that mixes at a slower tempo between the omunene. So the two parts combined sound like this. which is called Omugabe. Omugabe. And this is the player of the long drum, or the ngabe drum. And at times, this player can also play melodically with the two hands, like this. And I have to say that it sounds 10 times better that when you have the earth itself as a resonating chamber. It's, well, we use that term, an earthier sound. You hear the fundamental pitch really coming out. Um, it's, it's a great sound, the, the low range of the instrument. So um, these are all the different parts, all the six parts, give you an idea of how the music works. And so we're gonna play one of the staples of the Nachi Bembe repertoire, a piece called Twali Bamukwano. And this piece has many different sections. It actually has a total of 10 sections altogether. So I know you're getting a lot of Lusoga terms here today. Just a couple more for you, so bear with me. Echitundu. Echitundu. Echitundu means section. And so the structure that I just described for you, we just demonstrated the parts of the very first Echitundu or section. And so as you listen to this piece, you will hear the tone bank changing as we move from one section to the next. And then within each section, we have echisoko. Echisoko. Echisoko means variation. And these two terms were like the most important terms for me to know during my lessons in Uganda. Because as a foreigner to this music, it was very hard to know what's a variation and what's a new section. So I'd always be asking them this. But during each of the sections, there's plenty of room for variations to take place. And you'll hear that as well. And as it moves throughout, the tone bank doesn't just change radically from one section to the next. You'll hear a lot of carryover, so the tone bank kind of just gradually changes as we move. All right, so we're going to play for you now our, our featured piece from the presentation. And again, this is called Twali Bamakwano. It has 10 different Echitundu. And so just try to listen to all the things I just described from the way the top parts interlock to create the tone bank, the way the wobito draws out the resultant parts, and then of course the lower parts, um, the way those drum parts interact with everything. So this is Twali Bamukwano.
displayed that whole thing. They didn't need the commander. They didn't have to fix one thing. Good job, guys. <laughs> so also, I wanted to tell you the little tag at the end is like a signature. When you hear that at the end of one of the compositions, that means it's a Nachi Bembe arrangement. It's like the equivalent of the composer signing their name at the end of the piece. And so all of the Nachi Bembe repertoire has this signature at the end. And there you see them playing their instrument and Busoga. Okay, so when I worked with them over the course of the year, I learned a total of eight of these pieces. But in, in gigging with them, they had 22 pieces total uh, in their repertoire that they would play. And some of them were even longer than this. Uh, one actually had 15 different Echi Tundu in it. So by pieces, I mean pretty substantial um, compositions with many sections. And so pieces that were faster, like the one you just heard, using a lot of the Tamun Hibugo rhythm, Don't Break My Gourd, as well as uh, when the Omuneni would stop and I would kind of take over, that rhythm is called Irongo, and it's a dance for twins. So you hear these two common rhythms played, and of course it's meant for dancing. And so the, the great dancer Baraka would come out, and uh, he was kind of the star of the Nachibembe village, and when he would dance, everyone would come out. And so these are the, the dance rhythms played on the instrument. But also, at times, they slow things down, play a little bit softer, and feature their singer. And of course, there's uh, a lot of repertoire that focuses on song. And actually, it's the song that is the most improvised part of the music. So everything played on the Mbairi is fairly set. Of course, there's the Echi Soko and variations going on. But the singer has a lot of freedom to take a song text and relate it to whatever the occasion is. So one of the songs I would play a lot with Nachi Bimbe is called Sente Ne Kola, which means money does the work. So we played it at a funeral and they sang about, you know, the breadwinner of the family has gone and what a challenge this is, you know, monetarily. They'll play it at a wedding and he starts improvising about, you know, fiscal responsibility in a marriage, you know, keeping it together. We played it at my graduation uh, uh, party there at the university, my final recital at McHenry University, and he started improvising on, on the challenge of money for college students, you know, to buy your textbooks and everything. So the, the, the sentine kala would remain the same, but actually the details of the lyrics would change uh, a lot from one piece to the, uh, one performance to the next. And so I'd like to end the presentation by teaching you guys a song, just four words for you to learn. Abana. Abana. Bana means children. Uganda. Uganda. Children of Uganda. And those two words allied together. So you say, Aban Uganda. Aban Uganda. Combining them together. And then, Mwebale. Mwebale. Means thank you. Emirimu. Emirimu. The R is kind of flipped. Emirimu. Emirimu. So those also combine together. Mwebale Emirimu. Mwebale Emirimu. Aban Uganda, Muebole Amirimu. Aban Uganda, Muebole Amirimu. This is a more recent song called Amba. It was actually created by the Ugandan army at the end of the terrible regime of Idi Amin as the people took back their country. So the army was singing this song thanking the people of Uganda for restoring peace in their country and taking their, their country back. And so we're going to end our presentation with Amba. And if I could ask you guys to help out with the chorus.
answer questions you have. Um, this whole presentation I have put on Prezi, and I'm going to upload it to my website tonight. So if you go to markstonepercussion.com, I have a teaching page there, and the whole link for the Prezi will be there. So use it in your classrooms or whatever you want to do. Share it with your friends back home. Um, also, if you do have questions, I mean, I'm going to be around for the rest of PASIC. Please ask me your questions. If you're like taking off and driving right back to Michigan tonight, because I know some people are, uh, you can email me, stone at oakland.edu. Um, this is music that I really love and be happy to answer whatever questions you have. Thanks for coming out today.